There you go. Now everyone's big and bright. Well, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another lively online author conversation featuring not one, but two extraordinary award-winning journalists talking about their new books, Jean Guerrero, author of Hatemonger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and the White Nationalist Agenda, and Carl Hoffman, author of Liar Circus, The Strange and Terrifying Jury, Journey, A Strange and Terrifying Journey into the Upside-Down World of Trump's MAGA rounds. They both have really long uh, book names also. <laughs> my name is Megan Wilden, and it is my honor and delight to be the executive director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. For those who are not familiar with us, OLLI at BCC provides educational, social, and volunteer opportunities designed especially by and for people 50 years and better, but open to everyone. We have over 1,400 members and produced over 100 different programs a year, from classes in science and literature to distinguished speakers, special events, and more. If you're not a member, I encourage you to consider joining. More information can be found on our website at berkshireolly.org. And we are part of a national network of Ollies across the country. So I want to give a big hello to our sister Ollie members from all over the country, Hawaii, Arizona, South Dakota, Florida, and more. Thank you so much for joining us. This evening's program is presented as a Zoom webinar. So for those attending, you can relax. Your microphone and video camera are not on. However, we encourage you to submit questions for the speakers at any time via the chat box found at the bottom of your screen on most devices. If you'd like to practice, you can go ahead and type where you're watching from and say hello, and don't forget to hit enter. This Conversations with Authors series would not exist without the extraordinary support of Lisa Sharkey, Senior Vice President and Director of Creative Development for HarperCollins Publishers, where she has acquired and overseen the editing of more than 40 New York Times bestsellers. Before her success in book publishing, she held executive positions in television with Good Morning America, Inside Edition, and more, winning two Emmy Awards, She's also a Peabody and DuPont award-winning journalist as part of the team at ABC News that covered the events surrounding September 11th. And now it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Lisa Sharkey, who will introduce tonight's speakers and also serve as our moderator. Lisa? Thank you so much, Megan, for that lovely introduction. And because I work at HarperCollins, because both of our authors are HarperCollins authors under the William Morrow imprint, I just want to let you know that it's really special because we're getting two for the price of one. And actually, the price is free tonight. And these are really important books because I'm going to urge you to buy these books because we're going to be diving much deeper into some of the most frightening issues facing our country today and our democracy. And I'd love you to support authors because long-form journalism and authors and the freedom of the press is what makes our country work. Um, the speaker series actually started as a tribute to my mom, Mona Sherman. She was a past president of OLLI, and mom actually suddenly died 12 years ago tomorrow. So we are just shy of uh, the anniversary of her death. And uh, it was super shocking, obviously, because she was um, just 70 years old, and she was at the gym, and she passed away. And during that time in 2008, she loved Barack Obama. My mother was so excited to be voting for hope and change. And uh, I mean, I don't really think you could have imagined in 2008 that we'd be sitting here 12 years later, right, with a mere 19 days and six hours until November 3rd here on the East Coast. And so I think it's really important that we all learn about the transformation that's taken place in our country over the past 12 years and how we went from hope to hate. It's a, it's been a really scary time. And, um, you know, rather than being the enemy of the people, these award-winning journalists like Jean Guerrero and Carl Hoffman, they're the voices of the people. I mean, they're who keeps us honest. I mean, they're who bring, they're the people who bring truth to light. And when I was an investigative journalist for ABC News and other networks, we always had a phrase that in order to stamp out the cockroaches, you needed to shine a light on them. 
Right? <laughs> and that was the phrase that we used. But tonight we're not really talking about bugs other than perhaps the fly on Mike Pence's head. But we're talking about humans and some of whom are the architects of hatred and others of whom are their minions and who make claim to honor the Bible and the Constitution, but they actually present a really clear and present danger to the freedoms and the principles upon which our country, our beautiful country was founded. And Jean Guerrero is the author of Hate Monger. I'm gonna hold it up right here. Stephen Miller, Donald Trump and the white nationalist agenda. And her book provides us with a lot of answers. People might be scratching uh, their heads. How could a 30 something descendant of Eastern European Jews growing up in California sort of be that monstrous voice in Donald Trump's ear? and the architect of his vile anti-immigration policies. And so we're going to learn how Miller was a troll even before they called it a troll. And we're gonna learn um, who shaped Miller and learn more about someone who's really been one of the survivors of the Trump administration. Gene is an Emmy award-winning journalist, a border reporter, a contributor to NPR and PBS NewsHour. And she started her career at the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones as a foreign correspondent reporting out of Mexico City. Uh, Jean has also written the book Crux, a cross-border memoir, which won the Penn Fusion Emerging Writers Prize. And she will be talking to another extraordinary journalist, Carl Hoffman, who has just published Liar's Circus, seen right here, which is a strange and terrifying journey into the upside down world of Trump's MAGA rallies. So Hoffman has written about some of the most dangerous places in some of the most remote corners of the globe, but this MAGA world is not in a remote corner. It's just around the corner of many of our houses. And um, Hoffman was able to somehow insinuate himself into this world and go undercover where he was welcomed into the inner sanctum of our American nightmare. Liar's Circus tracks the MAGA faithful across 5,000 miles of the American heartland during the crucial arc of the Trump presidency, which began around the time of the impeachment and um, his reporting ended just at the beginning of the global pandemic in which we still find ourselves. Kirkus Reviews called Liar's Circus a valuable portrait of authoritarianism in action and its more than willing adherence. And Carl is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Savage Harvest, which was named a New York Times editor's choice and one of the Washington Post's 50 most notable works of nonfiction a few years back. And he's also written a Lunatic Express. He's a former contributing editor to National Geographic Traveler and Wild and has and wired as and traveled widely to over 80 countries. I wanna remind all of you that I'm going to be looking at your questions and you can put them into the chat. And while uh, Jean and Carl are talking, I will assess the questions. And then at the end of their conversation, I will pose your questions to them. I also wanna give a special shout out to Danielle Bartlett and Sharon Rosenblum tonight two of my colleagues who are the great publicists for these two great authors who have helped arrange tonight's talk. So thanks and take it away to HarperCollins authors. Wow, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone. I can't believe it. I'm looking at the little counter here. It says 535 uh, participants. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's pretty fantastic. So really amazing. I also, uh, um, I have a little bit of a sort of local connection to the Berkshires. I uh, actually went to University of Massachusetts Amherst back in the day, so not so far away. Um, I thought we'd, I'd start out by um, asking Jean to talk a little bit about alchemy, which is a word that comes up early on in her book. And it's this moment when Trump and Miller meet alchemy. And I use it too. And it, it hit me because I use it too. And when Trump meets, he when, when Trump interacts with the, the mobs at his rallies, there's this alchemy, uh, this, this sort of sense that the sum is greater than its parts. So Jean, can you exactly. just uh, maybe talk about that? Yeah, that struck me while reading your book as well. Just like that, that sort of unusual magic doesn't feel like the right word. Alchemy definitely feels like a better word um, that happens when, you know, these distinct pieces meet. And with Stephen Miller, I mean, he is officially the longest lasting advisor in the White House. And he has this outsized influence, even though he's, you know, he started out as a 31 year old who was essentially put in charge of the Department of Homeland Security. 
Um, and, you know, Trump has had a, this sort of emotional racism for, for decades. We know about, you know, him taking out these ads during the Central Park Five case, uh, you know, urging that the, the, the Black and Latino boys who were falsely accused of, of raping and killing a, a white woman in Central Park uh, be executed. So he's always had this sort of emotional racism. He was accused by the Department of Justice of discriminating um, in his in his buildings against Black people. But the thing about Stephen Miller is he, he what he brings to the table is a real discipline, a real work ethic, a real you know obsession with issues that Donald Trump doesn't really pay attention to the to the details on. And so that's that's one of the ways he's been able to have okay. this this huge impact on you know, Trump's speeches on, as well as on the immigration issue, um, you know, and, and this, this, this is, speaks to the fact that Stephen Miller, you know, he, he also understands Donald Trump better than I think any other advisor in the White House. You know, he understands him psychologically, he understands him spiritually, and he understands him emotionally. And this has roots in Stephen Miller's childhood. You know, he grew up with a father who was described to me as being very similar to Trump. He had um, he's a real estate investor who was plagued by bankruptcies and legal disputes related to his real estate company. So he, he grew up in a similar family to Trump, and he's able to, to have this alchemy with Trump because he understands him. He knows how to manage the relationship. And one of the crucial things is, you know, he is comfortable in Trump's shadow. He's always very careful and not to get out ahead of Trump. He's always careful to cast himself as a mere devoted vehicle for Trump's agenda. Whereas other advisors like Steve Bannon, you know, they, they're obsessed with media attention. They, they're very skilled at self-mythologizing through the press. And, and this doesn't work for, for Trump's ego. So Stephen Miller is always very careful not to do that. And, and it's also one of the sources of his power. And anytime in the bureaucracy that he wanted something done, he would invoke Trump's name. He would invoke Trump's demands and Trump's desires. So to challenge Stephen Miller was essentially to challenge Donald Trump. And, and it made people a lot of very uncomfortable, even national ex security experts who'd been there for decades. And, and, you know, the result of this is that we have a public relations flack who had no prior policy experience, um, you know, come into the White House at the age of 31 and be put in charge of, of policymaking for this country and, and take policies directly from white nationalist think tanks, um, from think tanks that were created by white supremacists who believe in population control for non-white people. And, and what this has done is, is it's had a broad impact for everyone, regardless of whether you care about immigration or not, because it has distracted the administration from being able to focus on real homeland security threats like domestic terrorism, like pandemics, like cyber warfare. And, and this is largely a result of the fact of, of Stephen Miller. And so to understand the disaster of 2020, you, you really have to understand the story of, of Stephen Miller. Um, but that just brings me back to your book, because I just, you know, that alchemy that, that you mentioned in, in regards to the rallies, I mean, you write beautifully about how Trump's power really swells up from the ground up and, and the rallies, you know, create this sort of animal that needs to be fed and, and refed. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, from my very first, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge, um, you know, news reader. So I was reading about rallies and reading about Trump. But when I went to my first rally in Minneapolis, almost a year ago, exactly, uh, October 10th, um, 2019, I mean, I was just floored and shocked by everything and by the whole atmosphere and by this sense of Trump. The first thing that, that hit me was Trump as this dazzling big man you know exactly. he's big in size i mean literally he's like six four and and he's he's big in this he looks big up there and he looks big next to people and he is so relaxed on the podium he leans in and he tells these stories and he speaks in a falsetto and i had this sense of this big man, a strong man, the forceful presence that I was sort of shocked by. And then, you know, in this arena, which is extremely brightly lit and which was another shocking thing. And, and so that Trump can see the audience and the audience can see Trump and we can see them, them all. And there's this, this word, the alchemy that, 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 sort of arises within that space and 
Trump, um, he grows. I mean, that's the thing that, and it struck me really not only in the rallies and, and more and more and more, but then when COVID hit and Trump was unable to go into to rally and he really started to fade a little bit from our consciousness in a, in a, in a way. And he started to deflate, I think, and you could sort of see that and feel it and he could feel it. So he started these daily white house briefings and people said, well, those are his rallies, but they weren't rallies. They were in front of skeptical journalists, not thousands, tens of thousands of people screaming his name. And so, you know, that's why he's from the day from the August 27th in the, uh, the last night of the GOP convention when he accepted and he insisted on having 1,500 people at the White House despite COVID and uh, social distancing be damned. You know, he sort of, he, he, he just decided to go, he had to go back into the rally space and he had to grow through that. And uh, he's been doing that. And now that's why even now, you know, he's, he's just coming off of coronavirus and he's got five rallies this week uh, alone. And it's, it's, uh, um, you know, I felt over and over again, this idea of it being an animal that grew and that had a life of its own. And, you know, people are at rallies uh, multiple days. I mean, you know, 50, 60 hours before, a rally start and camping out and that becomes this growing thing, this crowd that attracts other people and it attracts news and it has this power in this life of its own that people that we can all see. Yeah. I mean, I think you just, you did such an amazing job of describing the rallies and it reminded me of, of being at one of the rallies myself. Um, you know, it was, I start my book in, at a Trump rally where Stephen Miller, because during the 2016 campaign, Stephen Miller was often like the warm up act for, for Donald Trump. And he would come onto the stage and lavish praise on Trump. And, 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 you know, he, he clearly saw Trump and sees Trump in the same way that so many of his followers do as an almost like godlike figure, which you describe in your book. Yeah, um, it, it's amazing to see, um, you know, people talk about Trump as being heaven sent. I mean, people exactly. at rallies all the time and people, there'll be a momentary silence in the middle of his long speech and a man, you know, a, gr a, a gruff masculine voice will call out, I love you, you know, or I mean, I was in Tupelo, Mississippi and I, uh, a guy who had been helping construct the fencing drove out past us. I was with the super fans waiting and we started talking to him and I never would have believed this if I hadn't heard it. He said, you know, I would walk behind him and pick up his poop if he asked me. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I'm glad that you put that description out there of Trump, though, because I remember when I first saw him in person, when I was doing reporting for the Stephen Miller book, I was also just floored at this like weird like aura, like the superhuman aura that he had that just doesn't come across on television for me. And suddenly I, I could just could feel in my bones why he is so riveting to so many people and is able to con to con them into into these these false you know realities. Um, and what in fact, I want to pause you right there. Let's go right into you talk about in your book, you talk about Miller growing up in this in California and this land of fantasy of Hollywood and even Silicon Valley in a certain way is this fantastical place. And I think that that is much of what you're talking about and and, and speaks to the rallies, too. Can you talk about, about that? Some? Yeah. You know, I think Stephen Miller is, is a very much a product of California. And most people are like, how is that even possible? California is this very blue state, kind of leads the charge against the Trump administration in many ways. But the California in which Stephen Miller grew up was very different from the California of today. There was a lot of anti-immigrant hostility. There were statewide bipartisan attacks on affirmative action, on bilingual education, on social services for children of undocumented migrants. So in many ways, there was this sort of microcosm for what we are seeing nationally today. And I think the reason, you know, you, that, that you saw this resurgence of white supremacist ideologies 
in California during the 90s is in part because of this sort of fantasy landscape that that it represents. Um, this this like insistence on an old antique ideal, you know, old Hollywood. Stephen Miller was obsessed with John Wayne, um, you know, this sort of art, uh, outdated uh, idea of masculinity, uh, w- which you talk about in your book as well. You know, he he was obsessed with mobsters. I, I write in my I, one of his friends was telling me that well into his. Go ahead, well, well into his 30s, he would, you know, a lot of people like mobster movies, and Stephen Miller's favorite movie was Casino uh, by Martin Scorsese. Um, but but the thing is, he would dress up like the Robert De Niro mobster character well into his 30s and, and go to, to Las Vegas on trips with his family and with his friends, and he would pretend to be the Robert De Niro mobster character. And I think these these values that he had over the course of his life really speak to you know, why, why Trump appeals to Stephen Miller, you know, why Trump, why he was attracted to Trump in the first place, but also why, why Trump appeals to so many other people as well, you know, as you write about in in the rallies, which, which are this sort of capsule of, of American culture in this very interesting way with, with some of the same overlapping themes, if you can talk about that. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the rallies are this sort of arena where this fantasy takes place in a, and, and, and I think, you know, the subtitle of my book is this upside down world. And, you know, I think all of Trumpism really is an upside down world. It's like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, and, and the rally is just that in a really concentrated form. It's where all these people come together uh, you know, in particular, you know, white working class, non-college educated um, men and women come into this arena that is in a way like a, I mean, it made me think of a, of a, of a professional wrestling match in a certain way. You know, you've got a, bo- a box, two boxers could go 12 rounds and no one even gets knocked down and some guy wins by points. That's boring. I mean, that's like real politics, you know, negotiating and talking and it's not that fun and not that exciting. But in the Trump world, it's it's people, you know, jumping off of the, off of the ropes and smashing, smashing each other with, with folding chairs and pulling each other's hair and tackling each other. And that's what's happening in the rallies. You've got this, you know, thousands of people and this incredibly ear splitting music that I thought would be all kind of sappy country music. But it's the rock and roll from, you know, I'm a baby boomer, the rock and roll from my childhood. I mean, it's Rolling Stones and, you know. Uh, the Queen and Tina Turner and, you know, in all these sort of incongruities, you know, like you've got this anti-globalist racist talk, you know, playing Rolling Stones, you know, which is, um, uh, you know, British band riffing off of, uh, you know, Black Mississippi blues. And you've got um, people, uh, you know, the, the biggest song of all is uh, YMCA, Village People YMCA, which is this sort of gay anthem. And, you know, you've got that song and people you, in a place like um, uh, Louisiana or Tupelo, Mississippi, you've got, you know, thousands of evangelical Christians standing up, dancing and and making the YMCA you know, right, right before, you know, Pence comes out, who's, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, says being gay is a sin. I mean, you know, it's like this. And then, you know, someone like Trump or Brad Parscale will come out and say, you know, how many union people are here? We're here for the working man. And this is a, a man in a party that has that is dedicated to, you know, right to work laws, which decimate unions and says in his speech, you know, we will always protect your, um, you know, your right to uh, uh, to have a pre-existing condition, which, you know, while the administration is suing to stop the Affordable Care Act. So it's this up. It's this completely bizarre place and the arena people are dressed up they're dressed up in maga gear they they're dancing it's this place where that fantasy and trump is this man who is you know he'll say anything i mean that's the other thing that hit me back in the, my very first rally was that he was just i'd never heard someone lie so much and lie so brazenly and so he comes into a place this sort of fantastical arena and he says anything and and everything, things that are completely sort of the opposite the way they really are. And 
people buy it and they don't really know any better. Yeah, it's, it really captures like the cult-like reality of Trumpism and you know, you, you write about how, how so many, not it, like, like the average person at these rallies believes in strange conspiracy theories. And it just reminded me of the indoctrination theme that is a central part of my book because, you know, Stephen Miller, in the same way that so many Trump supporters that you write about are indoctrinated or radicalized in these fictional worlds, fictional belief systems, Stephen Miller was radicalized at a young age and in, in a very similar way. I mean, for him, it was it was a man named David Horowitz, a former Marxist turned right wing radical who introduced Stephen Miller when he was a teenager, uh, when he was going through a hard time and sort of feeling lost and displaced in, in the same way that a lot of the Trump supporters at these rallies do, very much, very you much. know. He had his family had lost a lot of money due to their, to their real estate struggles, and they'd had to move to a less affluent part of town. And this is when David Horowitz comes into his life and introduces him to this fantasy that he needs to save the United States from an existential threat, which, according to Horowitz, is the Democratic Party partnering with Muslims and people of color who, you know, pose, according to white supremacists, an existential threat to, to civilization. So David Horowitz introduced Stephen Miller to the idea that, you know, systemic racism against people of color is a figment of your imagination, that the only real racism, the only important racism is racism against white men, that all of the values that we hold dear in America, things like freedom and equality and justice, that all of these things are because of white men. And if you don't have a white majority in this country, then you, things fall apart. That multiculturalism itself is, is an apocalyptic threat to civilization. And all of Stephen Miller's actions in the White House stem from this radical idea that, that diversity is, 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 is it, it will spell the doom of America, which is contrary to what so many, you know, Americans have have been taught to believe and and it stems from this conspiracy theory of white genocide the the great replacement theory that has motivated so many acts of white terrorism like the you know the El Paso massacre where 23 people were killed uh, last August by a white terrorist who thought he was saving the United States from a Hispanic quote unquote invasion um well, what did the Charlottesville people uh chant i mean we exactly. we will we will not be replaced you will not replace us exactly i mean and, and this reminds me you know of the QAnon conspiracy theorists that you that you write about it's in both cases trump is like this in both QAnon and the white genocide theory that is embraced by white supremacists and which as i show in my book you know stephen miller is inspired by there's documents about this this isn't me just speculating you know Stephen Miller's emails show that he's inspired by white supremacist ideas has recommended white supremacist literature to to friends and colleagues um but this QAnon conspiracy theory and the white genocide conspiracy theory both sort of hinge on this idea that Trump is like the savior who who's going to save the world from some horrible thing happening. In the case of the white supremacists, it's black and brown people. In the case of the QAnon conspiracy theorists, it's people doing horrible things to children. So how did you, I mean, I feel like you did a really good job of, you know, both, both painting, you know, these supporters in an honest way um, and, and showing the real harm th that they do and holding them accountable for their racist beliefs. But at the same time, you tried to approach them with real empathy, which is something I tried to do in, in my book as well. But maybe you can talk a little bit about like, how did you navigate that, that line or find that balance between, between, you know, being truthful and, and but also trying to be empathetic. Yeah. I mean, you know, people say to me all the time, you know, Oh, how did you do it? Weren't you afraid? And I mean, I think that overstates it a little bit. I mean, or, or, or a lot, you know, I mean, I didn't feel, I mean, I'm a white male, so uh, that <laughs> worked in my favor, I guess. But I mean, you know, I just went in and I sort of didn't know what I was doing really. But by the third, the second rally I sort of started meeting, I realized that I had to go stay there longer and longer and longer. And by the second rally, I kind of met and talked to a few more people. And by the third in Tupelo, Mississippi, you know, I went to the arena. I parked my car about 54 hours before the event. And then I, uh, and I walked around so I could, because I knew there would be this core of super fans um, and I found them and I was the, I was there early enough 
this time. I was the sixth one. And I had talked to a couple of the guys before, and one in particular, this guy named Rick Stone, who holds the world's record and no number of Trump rallies attended. It's 60 something now, I believe, a, a former strip club operator. Um, and he said, Oh, Carl, come on, you're number six. Come on in. You know, and that patted my spot. I put my chair down. So, you know, ultimately I just sat with them and I, and I spent, you know, up to almost 200 hours, um, sitting, you know, I became very good. Well, I'm not very, I became friends with, um, these people really, um, over that time period. And then from that rally, from from that point on, from rally to rally, you know, we were texting and we were saving each other's places in line. And I was honest with them. I mean, I said, I wasn't undercover. I said, I'm a, I'm a writer and I'm writing a book on Trump and I'm writing a book on the rallies. And, uh, you know, if they asked me what I thought, I said, well, you know, I'm here to listen. And, um, and then, but over time we got to be, be, you know, you can't spend dozens and dozens of hours with, with people without, you know, living a lie. So, you know, who I was became, became evident. I was obviously more liberal than them, but we all, um, you know, I mean, it's the same way I do any kind of reporting, you know, which I've spent a lot of time in very remote places and in, with indigenous people. And, you know, I just sort of subsume myself and, and ask, you know, I don't go in there condescending or patronizing them or saying, you know, they're racist or anything. You know, I just listen and I spend time with them and, um, uh, you know, and then there was this kind of arc in the book in which I actually, you know, at first I was really, um, lonely and, and apart and you know, I felt horrible and I, it was terrible. It was miserable. And then I kind of became friends with them and it was kind of fun almost. I was like hanging out as part of it in the parking lots. And then the end, it became, I just, I sort of dropped and it was just so empty and, and, and became, uh, it's physically exhausting to me. But one of the things I want to go back to that, you know, the first thing that people say to me always, or one of the first things they say when they're talking to a, a liberal or a journalist, they always say, all these people call us racist and we're not racist. You know, I'm not a racist. They call us that word, but we're not. And, you know, we just want to stop illegal illegals from coming in and yet they're supporting this really fundamentalist, fundamentally racist policies and a president who is, you know, extraordinarily racist. And, you know, I, I, in your book, you talk about Miller, you know, again, he's always doing this dance talking, you know, there's always this sort of verbal um, rhetorical dance that we're not racists. We're trying to do something else, but exactly. it's, it's racist. I mean, it's it's all based on race. It's all based on on color and exactly. I mean, he was taught though by David Horowitz and other mentors to launder white supremacist ideas through language about heritage, through the language of national security, through the language of economics. You know, immigrants are are bad because they bring crime. They bring you. Know, they're bad for the economy. They drain resources. All of these things that are not based in actual research, which shows you know the opposite. Um, but 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 he knows the importance of laundering you know, racist and white supremacist ideas through these other narratives so that they will appeal to a mainstream. And that's something that really started to take off in, in the California of Stephen Miller's youth. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you ask him, he's going to deny, he always denies that he's racist. He says it's very offensive to be called a white nationalist. Um, he he gets furious and, and his, his mentor, David Horowitz as well, you know, he says he's not a white nationalist, uh, that he's not a racist. But if you look at his books, you know, they're very much rooted in, in race and this idea of white superiority and white identity politics. But they, they, you know, Stephen Miller has tried to distance himself from people like Richard Spencer, a well-known neo-Nazi and white nationalist. But he he worked with Richard Spencer when he was at Duke University, when he was a student at Duke University. He worked with him to, to bring the white nationalist Peter Brimlow to speak at Duke University. So it's it's just 
I think it's extremely important to call these things out for what they are. And there's been a real reluctance in journalism to, to do that. You know, we're, we're always um, very hesitant to use words like racist or white nationalist to describe people, you know, if they haven't called themselves that because we don't know what's in people's hearts. Um, and I think for the most part, that's been a good instinct that we have as journalists, right? You, you know, I mean, it's very important that we be neutral and that we, um, have objectivity. It's what makes journalism an integral pillar of our democracy. But at the same time, it's created this space where white nationalists and, and white supremacists can operate with impunity in our institutions and, and spread and deliberately incite racism and white supremacy in, in the masses. You know, Trump, uh, Stephen Miller has been taking language straight out of white nationalist literature and and inserting it into Trump's speeches you know and 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 the same strategies where they use false crime statistics to paint people of color as more innately violent than white people they they use graphic gory descriptions of alleged migrant crimes to really incite white fear and white hatred they um you know they referred to anti-racist protesters as agitators and anarchists and mobs who want to destroy the uni the country and that language agitators anarchists and mobs to describe anti-racist comes straight out of this book called the camp of the saints which is a white supremacist book about the destruction of the white world by brown people described as animals and beasts and monsters and and it's a book that Stephen Miller promoted in 2015 um, and so I think it's just so important that we use accurate language to describe what is going on so that you know people who who are not really racist and don't want to do harm to, to other people don't get caught up in the spell of of these narratives that you see Trump perpetuating at, at his rallies. I mean, one of the things that struck me about your book because of the fact that, you know, indoctrination is such a key theme in my book is like you write about being in your, I think you're in your car listening to talk radio through Trump country and and you hear these exalta exaltations of martyrdom and this really apocalyptic language and, and you draw a parallel to the language of ISIS and you're like well what really is the difference like we're, we're sort of calling on on people to, to to sacrifice themselves in the name of you know this great godlike leader in, in in similar ways and so I don't know I, I just thought well, you might want to talk about that the you know the the subject of religion is huge we all know that evangelicals support trump and that he he has this whole support but i think what was shocking to me in spending so much time uh, at the rallies and with trumpians was really the depth of that and that that you know and it kind of started I, I drove and my i both drove and flew the rallies but the first i drove about 5000 miles to begin with and, you know, when you're driving through America, sometimes there's a big desert of uh, radio and there's almost always a religious station. And I and I, I mean, in numerous places, there was always one, you know, one hand off to the other. And the the conversation was was remarkable to me. I mean, it was so it, it very sort of millenarian. I mean, very end days. You're talking about the, the rapture and the tribulation and. Um, and, and, and so that was right. And I, and that was all rattling around in my head. I mean, I found it shocking. And also this idea of, um, you know, that, 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 you know, you must love God more than your own family. You must love God more than your own children. Because for instance, if you had to choose between loving God and saving your child, which would you do? I mean, you know, it's a, it's the easiest question in the world. I have got three kids. I mean, I'm, I'm saving my kids. But the correct answer on the radio was that you would let your kids, you know, burn or or be some, you know, a horrible thing happen. And they were often very graphic, and some horrible thing would you'd let because you'd choose God and and or that, um, you know, these a pastor cited a uh, these cops in Egypt walking down the streets saying, you know. Uh, um, you know, I'm a martyr, take me and mm -hmm. saying, you know, how, how wonderful that was. And, you know, which is the same as, you know, not much different from, you know, an, an, an ISIS uh, uh, suicide bomber. And then I went into the rallies themselves. And it, it was in Dallas, I said to a woman um, who was sitting next to me, and who I'd actually been talking to a long time. And I said, you know, I'm surprised at the lights. I thought the lights would dim and there'd be a spotlight on Trump. She said, well, it's like church. 
And wow. that started plunging me down this whole rabbit hole of reading and and trying to understand more. And, you know, th there's always a prayer before um, uh, uh, a rally. And those prayers are often, you know, they're hailing Donald Trump. And they're, uh, people are telling me Donald Trump is heaven sent. And he's been sent to us for a purpose. And all these, it, it made me understand that the rallies played off a really powerful icon in American history, which is the, the, the charismatic preacher. I mean, you know, we think of sort of the cowboy, the Marlboro man as an American icon, but another one is the, 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 the preacher and the, and, and, uh, a revival that those revivals have been really fundamentally important to American history. I mean, America was founded by, you know, the Puritans and this sort of a uh, 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 fundamentalist pro white Protestantism. And, you know, Trump is when talking about everything that Miller um, as you know, uh, talks about this, the idea of, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the country being attacked and sort of heaven, it's really heaven or hell, it's saints and sinners. And Trump does this extraordinary job where he stands up and that's what a rally, all of a rally is, is demonizing and saying, you know, the, the Democrats are socialists, they're communists, they're Marxists, they're gonna take your guns, take your religion, they're gonna destroy your way of life, they're coming after you. And, exactly. and, that is, it's like heaven, it's like, and people actually, you know, uh, um, sometimes pass out in Trump rallies as they do at, in, um, in revivals. And, you know, there are millions of Americans who grew up with those kinds of revivals and every few years and with that figure standing up in the bright lights and, you know, it's an incredibly powerful thing, and it, and it speaks to this, this, this fundamental chord in American history. And, I, and from your book, you know, it's clear that everything that so much of that, you know, Miller's so conscious of, and he's so sort of manipulated in a well, way. He, he's conscious of it, but he also embodies it. And I think that's what makes him so dangerous. I think he's one of the few true believers in this administration I mean, Trump is motivated primarily by self-interest, by, you know, wanting what he'll, he'll say, whatever he, he thinks he needs to say to, to get power. I think Stephen Miller, though, I mean, he truly believes that he's somehow saving the United States by systematically targeting communities of, of color. And the thing is, he brings real strategy to the table. You know, he he. He, he one of the first actions that he did in the White House was to create an office that was dedicated to the daily demonization of immigrants, you know, pumping out press releases about their alleged crimes. And he wanted he he, he told ICE officials to please feature prominently uh, photos of their tattoos, um, especially, you know, show photos of immigrants that look frightening. Um, so to, so really just, you know, bringing this this strategy to, to get people you know, worked up about the immigration issue, but it's so much, it's so much more than the immigration issue, as, as I was saying earlier. And, and a lot of this is, is this, this art that you, David Horowitz taught him of, because David Horowitz comes from the left as a former Marxist, he taught Stephen Miller how to use the language of the civil rights movement against the left, against, you know, communities of color. So for example, casting white conservative men as victims of discrimination uh, based on their skin color, um, calling people of color the real racists or the real oppressors. And, and this is why you see Trump now, you, you know, it's th th basically he, he learned how to invert the language of the civil rights movement and deflect. And this is what you see Trump doing now when he's attacking you know, he's tr he's stopping funding for uh, racial sensitivity training programs within the government and calling them racist. Um, so this idea that any any acknowledgement of racism is itself racist is, is a real gaslighting technique that Stephen Miller learned how to use, but not only learned how to use, he learned to, how to use it as a fanatic. And he is now an extremist in the White House who... Uh, has gutted the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, right now, most of the top leadership positions at DHS are either vacant 
or held by people in acting capacity so that they can serve as puppets for Stephen Miller. For example, the acting secretary, Chad Wolf, right now, I'm told, you know, was was very moderate, very careful, but Stephen Miller would just like call it call him and and talk and talk and talk and talk. And and one one senior administration official told me that that it, it was like hypnosis. He hypnotized Chad Wolf into into believing that he had to target immigrant communities and now Black Lives Matter protesters and and really turn DHS into a political weapon in order to keep his job. Um, and so so it's, 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 it's fascinating. I, I was fascinated reading your book because I've just spent so much time thinking about extremism and how people are radicalized. But this is, you know, it's, it's not just about one man in the White House having this outsized influence on policy and rhetoric. Uh, it, it's like it's having a real effect on so many people's lives. And like, I, I was just picturing you at the rally because I remember I have, you know, I've, I also reported in Mexico, like I've reported in Mexico, Central America, various, you know, like very uh, violent parts of those, of those places. But I have never felt as unsafe <laughs> as I did at a Trump rally. Like I felt like I had to hide the fact that I was a journalist Um and, 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 you know, obviously reporting this book, hate monger was, was, was very sensitive. Stephen Miller did not want to talk to me. I approached him from the very beginning, wanting to him and the white house to be an active part of the process, but ultimately they, they declined to be interviewed. So I had to interview more than a hundred people who, who knew him, who worked with him and, and review, you know, hundreds of pages of documents and private correspondence to understand him. But there, there was always in the back of my mind that that fear of like, well, well, you know, the, a lot of people were afraid to talk to me because they feared retaliation by Stephen Miller. So, so being a person, you know, at these rallies and, and trying to get a real sense of them as someone who is an outsider must have just been, you know, just, I, I really empathized with you when you talked about how, like, you just felt so lonely. <laughs> Yeah, that loneliness was 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 like in a way the deepest loneliness I'd ever felt. I mean, even not counting, you know, I mean, I'd been I've been away from my family for a month in a swamp, and I wasn't as lonely as I was in Trump rallies. But I want to ask, I want to, you say in the book that when 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 Miller heard Trump, there was like a jolt of electricity ran through him, and that. You know, Bannon, I mean, back in the early days in 2015 and 2016, that Bannon, I mean, sort of I had this sense that Bannon and, and Miller and other people saw in Trump this vessel in a way of somebody that 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 would be able to push their agenda. And you, for instance, you, I love this. You say, well, the wall was never, never really supposed to be a wall. It was just this mnemonic device that was for him to sort of talk about a wall, wall is metaphor and everything. And, but I, you know, but Bannon is long gone now from yeah. Trump. And that, you know, I think there, I had this sense when I was, when I was throughout my whole time at the rallies, that more and more that Trump was this authoritarian figure and that he was this rising authoritarian figure. And, you know, as you said, it's all about him. I mean, that really, it was all about Trump. And that the, that's how the rallies, you know, they feed him, they make him big to his people, but they make him feel big. And when he goes home to Washington, I, I imagine, I say to myself, well, you know, what's it like to be, you know, in this environment where people are calling out, I love you, and they're going, Trump, 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 you know, and they've waited days out in the cold and the rain to see you. And, and you uh, then, you know, in, in a couple hours later, you fly back on your, on your 747 and you're in the White House and you've got all these people yelling at you and you have that, that those people in your head that are your foundation, you know, upon which your power rests. And, that for somebody like Trump, you know, the White House has to be an incredibly powerful drug. I mean, there's no more powerful position in the world in a certain way. But, you know, and for, some, for, for, a, for a well-adjusted person, but for somebody like Trump, who's so egomaniacal and such a sociopath, I mean, it's really crazy. And one of the things that I think is, is not talked about 
that much is the way the ra- he uses the rallies. Like you talk about Stephen going up and saying, you know, always praising Trump. Now, people, Trump will have all of these, like if it's in Texas, then there'll be Cruz will be there. And, you know, Rick Perry will be there and Lieutenant so Governor crazy. will be there. And there are all these people there. And, you know, then all the GOP down ballot people and he'll call them out and he'll tell us a little story about them. That story is always about how loyal they are. And then um, exactly. he'll tell a story and, he, and it's all and, you know, people are roaring. Twenty thousand people are roaring. And so I, I have the sense he's holding them up and he's holding them out in front of the crowd. And he's saying, I can give you this. I can give you the, these people, but I can take it away, too. And that that's a really fundamental part of his of his power. And that I, this sense that Bannon and all those people thought they could control him. They thought there was a vessel, but his ego was so big, it's, it, was, it was beyond control, but maybe not for Miller. Well, exactly. I was, I was going to say Miller is like, you know, those, those supporters chanting at the Trump rallies. He is that person in the White House. He is the person whispering in Trump's ear, constantly re- reminding him of how wonderful and perfect he is and never questioning him. And, you know, Stephen Miller does not have one face with Donald Trump and another face behind closed doors. He just is constantly a Trump loving devotee ideologue um, who, who sees Trump as a vessel for the white nationalist agenda, um, but but also is just very loyal to Donald Trump as a person. He, he you know, he, he sees him like a father. And I, I really see that. I really believe that Trump sees Stephen Miller as, as a son. You know, he went to his wedding earlier th- um, this year as the coronavirus was spreading um, and, ta- and gave a speech about how important Stephen Miller is to him, how much he means to him, how much he has done for him. And I don't think that people understand just how much Stephen Miller has done for, for Trump. You know, as early as 2016, you know, Trump does not think that he would have won in 2016 without Stephen Miller. Um, and he doesn't think he's going to win in November without Stephen Miller. And that's why you see him leaning more and more into the apocalyptic uh, rhetoric and, and and the hardline immigration policies, responding to the pandemic by suspending green cards and shutting down asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border instead of distributing masks and medical equipment. Um, but it goes back to 2016 when Stephen Miller you know, he he secured for Donald Trump the Border Patrol and ICE union endorsements, which were <laughs> huge. The Border Patrol and ICE had never endorsed a presidential candidate before, and they gave Trump real uh, real law and order credentials that he didn't have. You know, people kind of saw him as a joke. A lot of immigration restrictionists rolled their eyes at the idea of a border wall. They knew that we've been building border barriers at the, for decades and that all they really have done is reroute traffic under the underground into tunnels as far deep as 90 feet and into the ocean and into drones, into the airports, into the ports of entry. And the person who actually brought real policies to the table was Stephen Miller uh, because he was pulling these, poli- I mean, he had no real policy expertise, but he was pulling these policies from these think tanks that I mentioned earlier that were created by white supremacists who believe in race-based pseudoscience, believe in the genetic superiority of whites, uh, you know, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, uh, FAIR, which was created by John Tanton, who believed in population control for non-white people. So, it, you know, I really believe that if Trump loses in November, this isn't going to go away. Um, you know, Stephen Miller he's young. represents, he's young, <laughs> but he also represents a movement. And and you see that movement in in the rallies that you document. I mean, they're having a real impact with this rhetoric across America. And the the one thing that gives me kind of hope or optimism is remembering that we saw this in California in the 90s when non-Hispanic white people became a minority for the first time in the state. There was this white backlash, this white fear, these attacks on the immigrant community. But it was almost like growing pains as the state began to embrace multiculturalism and diversity for the strength that it actually represents. And I'm wondering if you saw any glimmer of, of like that hope or like that transition at rallies, or is this really something that we're going to have to contend with for a very long time? Well, I mean, you know, that's the big question, obviously. Um, I, you know, I didn't see, there was certainly no, through my 
throughout my rally going, there was no lessening of, um, you know, the longer I spent, the more human, human, humanity I sort of saw in those, the people that I was with, because I spent a lot of time with them, but I didn't see a lot of hope in them in changing their positions. Um, you know, they're really lost and really bamboozled. Um, and there are a lot of people, you know, we also forget that there's a lot of people making a lot of money off of this. I mean, you know, people like, you know, Fox News and Tucker Carlson sure. and, you know, Rush Limbaugh. And there is money in extremism because that extremism gets eyeballs. And, and you know, I don't see any of that going away when, um, uh, you know, it, not when, I should say, if, you know, Biden were to win and the Democrats to take us take the Senate, you know, all of those um, strains are still there and all those forces are still there. And, you know, we haven't really talked about it, but, you know, the reality is that that I thought going into the this project that things like QAnon and, you know, these conspiracy theories were fringe, like, you know, even mainstream Trumpians didn't believe those things. And that, I found that not to be true. I right. mean, you know, that out of 22,000 people, you know, I mean, obviously I didn't speak to everyone, but I mean, I almost never spoke to someone who didn't believe at some level, some conspiracy theory. And, you know, they don't, they literally don't read, read the newspaper and many don't even watch Fox news. You know, when all of your information comes from Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, you know, it's completely skewered. And I don't know how that that's not going to change after November or after January, no matter who's elected. And it's really, um, and I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know what the solution to that is, but it's really profound. Well, yeah, because Trump is not the only one who, who is being enriched by division. One of the, one of the most memorable parts of your book for me was when you write about how like he, he's not going to try to stop the division in the country because he his power comes from that division his power comes from from being able to demonize and point to yeah, the, he, the enemy he, he can't and, bring us together that he would he would he would he would like va vaporize vaporize exactly you know, he, but he's not the only one i mean national you know the the media as you were talking about and one of the things that struck me <laughs> was realizing you know after immersing myself in the ideology of stephen miller and reading all of these extremist um, books that had inspired him, I began to see that everywhere. I began to see those same arguments being made on Fox News, on Breitbart, obviously, like on all of these conservative news outlets, including mainstream ones. Um, and, and so it is It is something that, you know, people, people it's, it's very lucrative to, to divide people, you know, because it, it, get, it gets people's attention. Like, oh, what, where's the enemy now? Hatred sells. Um, and it's, it's, it's just it's so important to, to, you know, read about how this happens and, and try to understand it. Because I think that's the only way that we can really, as a country, you know, break that spell that has been cast by, by not just people like Trump, well, people like Trump and, and so many others. There's something I want to ask you, and that is when I was in the, reporting this book, I did a lot of reading, and I was reading in particular about European, you know, about fascism and the rise of fascism, and which sent me, you know, to the history of Germany and Hitler. And I ended up quoting in several places using these quotes from Hitler and these sort of examples from it. And, you know, people who read the book and my, even my editor were always like my agent, like, no, you got to get rid of that. Like that's too extreme and it's not really right. And I resisted that because I thought it, the more time I spent with Trump and in that world, the more I felt it was, there were, there were, there were huge parallels, not, it's not identical. Hitler and Trump were radically different people, but then I was reading your book and I came across this Hitler quote and it was mm -hmm. just like, so right on. And I thought, you know, it's, it's not, it, it, it's not an it's, out, outrageous parallel at all. Right. It's, it's, it's really scary. not. I mean, it's how, this is how it begins. It, I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, it hasn't reached, we're, we're not executing, you know, a bunch of people or anything like that, but the demonization, the hatred, 
uh, the the framework is being laid and Stephen Miller's own family members like his great his grandmother on his mother's side you know she spent her retirement compiling the family history so that her grandchildren like Stephen Miller would never forget the dangers of demonization that you know his great grandparents fled in eastern europe the nationalist agitators who were causing you know jews to be executed uh, because they were being scapegoated for everything that was going wrong in in the in the region um and, and so she recorded all of this for him she recorded it so that they would so that he would never forget the value of people who come to this country with nothing but the clothes on their back and speaking no english just as his ancestors did and these are lessons that he ignored and directly attacked and i think you know, we are seeing that mentality and that f- forgetting a, of history. Um, and that only means that history will be repeated unless we remember, you know, we, we, we won't be able to avoid something like, like what we saw under yeah, Hitler. Yeah, I think that, that hatred is real and they're, they're deliberately inciting it. Yeah. And I think there was this sense that, you know, people thought they could control Hitler and um, they couldn't, and then it was too late. And, exactly. Um, you know, I think, so I, I think, yeah, some frightening parallels. So I have one more uh, question for you, which is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm liberal. I mean, I'm very progressive. And so it was strange to me to be going into this world and spending so much time. But ultimately, I did make some friendships in among the guys that I mostly spent, that I spent most of my time with. And I enjoyed their company much of the time, some of the time, especially if we did not talk about politics. And there was a pleasure, there was pain, but there were moments of pleasure. But reading your book, I thought, what's it like to write a book about such a despicable character? Like, (laughs) there's almost nothing redeeming about that I can see about Stephen Miller. Yeah, I mean, honestly, usually the more you learn about someone, the more complicated and and layered and and, and relatable that they are. But I was struck with the fact that the opposite happened with Stephen Miller. You know, I found his humanity and stories about him as a little boy wanting to get his father's attention and, you know, feeling displaced and angry and all of that. But then over the years, you see that he actually becomes less and less complex. And and for me, that's why it's a case study in radicalization. It is what happens when someone is consumed by an ideology and, and, you know, ends up the most powerful person in the White House. Um, But, you know, I... It was. It's interesting because because I I spoke to you know I spoke to people who who were empathetic to him and friends of his and um but it was just such a strange experience because even his friends like one of his closest friends who I interviewed extensively for the book and gave me a lot of great information <laughs> he he became very scared after a while about how much he had told me and and worried that Stephen Miller was going to retaliate against him and. Um, you know, and our, 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 it became harder and harder to, to, to speak with him. Um, and, and that, that was the case with so many people I interviewed and, and it created a sort of paranoia in me where I felt the need to, you know, um, you know, I, I've worked with Pen America to 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 make sure that my cybersecurity was locked down ahead of publication of the book. I paid for this service called Privacy duck where they erase all of the personal information of yourself and your family members from the internet so you cannot be doxxed. Um, so I, I took all these additional safety precautions that I've never had to do before just based on like the just the, the paranoia of my own sources and how they felt that they were going to be retaliated against if they if, for having spoken to me and it just it just made me want to be very careful. Also just knowing like how, how many, how much, how often journalists are are targeted by these far right uh, radicals, trolls online. Right. Well, I mean, I think um, Gene and I could talk all night. I, um, you know, Lisa, did did you want to work some questions in or? Yeah, I see some questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Gosh, this is just Fascinating. You guys are brilliant. And I just, for anybody who's sort of just joining, I want to remind you before we get to uh, the questions um, that we've got uh, Carl's book here, Liar's Circus, and Jean's book here, Hate Monger. And um, these are important books that really take us inside the situation that we're dealing with today. Um, 
So um, Mary is asking, and I really like this question, and maybe this is for both of you or maybe for Carl, but how orchestrated are these rallies? You see people wearing the same T-shirts. Just the other day at the White House, right, he he held his quote-unquote rally and everyone was in matching shirts and people, are people being paid to attend some of these events? No, I, you know, people are, I don't think, you know, I don't think people are paid, but what the campaign does is they, um, you know, they gather people together. For instance, um, they're almost overwhelmingly white, um, white people at the rallies, but there are, you know, black people and people of color and the, 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 the campaign will actually gather those, uh, many of those people and put them in T-shirts, for instance, matching T-shirts that, and give them signs that say, you know, blacks for Trump. And then they'll put them, seat him, seat them behind the president, because that's where the cameras show. So that, you know, when the can when, when you can, when you see, when you watch Trump speaking, there'll be all these this rainbow of people of color <laughs> behind him. And, you know, it's just the worst kind of tokenism. I mean, it, it, it's so, there's that kind of setup all the time. Um, so Celia is asking uh, about Stephen Miller's relationship to Judaism. A lot of people want to know about this. How can he sort of, and, and I'm also curious about his relationship with Jared Kushner. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's like I said, mo most of his family members, they, they, believe, they, one of them, th you know, thinks he should be tried for crimes against humanity for what they've been doing. And they think that it ignores the lessons that, th that many in the Jewish community find important about embracing immigrants and making sure that you never demonize the other. But, you know, Stephen Miller yeah. from a very young age yeah. would write about how like, he, he never renounced his Jewishness, but he, you know, he even went on a, a birthright trip to Israel after college, and it was very much a part of his life. But but he would write about how because Jewish people are a minority, he finds himself more invested in American holidays. And for him, somehow that excludes Jewishness. Like he, you know, and he, he writes about how American holidays, American culture, American you know, customs are more important to him than Jewish ones because Jewish people are a minority. So that's, that was very interesting to me. And also knowing that his mentor, David Horowitz is also a Jewish man and, and who, you know, his, his entry into the immigration issue was actually first a sort of anti-Palestine, super full-throated Zionism, pro-Israel mentality where, you know, David Horowitz talks about how all Palestinians, all Arabs are all Muslims are terrorists and, and, you know, conflates them. And, and Stephen, he put Stephen Miller in charge of his terrorism awareness project where that was basically all they did was conflate Palestinians with terrorists. And, you know, he attacked a Palestine solidarity movement conference. So, you know, his, his, his obsession with immigrants from Latin America and Africa was, was, proceeded with this extreme hostility towards Palestine. And there is a growing minority in the Jewish community in, in the United States who, who have these views that overlap in many ways with white nationalists who, who hate Jewish people and who, who want to hurt Jewish people. So it's, it's, it's a mystery, it's a conflict, and it exists inside of Stephen Miller. Um, a lot of people are very curious. They understand perhaps how people can get drawn into the cult of Trump. But what they don't understand is how Republicans and Congress and in the Senate, what is their excuse? <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, I mean, that's the one of the greatest mysteries. I mean, one thing you see is that Trump is powerful and that he is somebody who doesn't pay any attention to the norms and the guardrails and is willing to just do anything. And, you know, there have been these people, Jeff Flake, for instance, who, um, you know, come out against Trump and then they're destroyed. I mean, this is, I go into this whole thing about, um, uh, I read the work, this work of uh, Elias Canetti, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1981, and he had fled fascism in Europe, and he wrote a book called Crowds in Power, and it was like reading, a, it was like Kennedy was going to Trump rallies, you know, I mean, it, it was, it, it was, it was so eerily on point. And, you know, he talks about this whole sort of the, the, the authority, 
the, the authoritarian sort of need to kill and um, and that uh, you know the, the 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 most perfect subject is the one who's the, is the dead subject and I'm speaking metaphorically here but um, you know so that's what you see in the rallies for instance you see him bringing out these people parading them and dangling them in front of the crowd and talking about their loyalty and saying I'll give you this but I'll take it away and that if anybody you know who you know look at all the the you know Vindman I mean you know the Alexander Vindman the most you know the this guy who's like a a, a Hollywood character of somebody who gave his you know of an American patriot and yet he's vilified and driven from from his job, driven from the army, um, and that's typical. You know, people who opposed Trump were were killed by him. You know, and you look at all of the people in his his cabinet, and um, you know, Secretary of State. Apologies, the dog was barking. Um, and um, you know, those people failed to survive. So, you know, I think that's what explains that. And, you know, you, you get people are corrupted by power and they're close to that power. I mean, it, it's it's you know, it, it's that simple in a way. Well, and I think I could speak to that question as well, because, Sorry. you know, they, they realized the, these other Republicans realized that this was a very effective strategy at rallying the masses and they realized it even before Trump came along, and it was in large part the work of Stephen Miller. You know, in 2012, <laughs> the Republican Party published an autopsy report after the 2012 midterm elections about how, you know, they needed to become a more diverse party. They needed to be more inclusive. They needed to campaign among communities of color in ways that they never had before. A real reckoning with racism in the Republican Party. And then Stephen Miller, you know, read that report and he met up with Steve Bannon. He met up with his then boss, Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions. And they said, OK, we are going to make sure that the Republican Party does the opposite. And we are going to use immigration, the issue of immigration, to do that. And we're going to double down on white voters. Um, the, uh, Stephen Miller uh, brought up this uh, analysis uh, f- by, by Real Clear Politics about the, quote, missing white voter in the 2012 elections. And this missing white voter is, is, the, pers- is the voter that the Republican Party ended up doubling down on appealing to using what, specifically white fear. There's a strategy paper that Stephen Miller was was given by his mentor, David Horowitz, that I write about in my book about how the Republican Party needs to remake itself around demonization of its political opponents and specifically fear. You, you, you know, Obama used hope to win and, and the Republicans need to use fear. I think it's going to be harder for them to use fear this this time around, just because people are so exhausted. Um, you know, I feel like fear is going to be less effective in 2020 because people want hope. I mean, we're, we're all exhausted by the pandemic. We're all exhausted by the, the economic, you know, c- collapse that we have basically. And I think it's going to be less effective, but this is why the Republican party was radicalized because st- people like Stephen Miller worked in collaboration with, media provocateurs like Ann Coulter and Tucker Carlson, they built alliances to really pump out these narratives about how everything wrong in people's lives was because of immigrants or because of radical leftists or because of every, everyone else was to blame uh, and never really addressing the systemic or structural issues that, that were at the root of people's problems. Um, ben is wondering, and I love this question because I was thinking it myself, is there a way to deprogram Trump supporters the way people who have been in cults are deprogrammed? What do you guys think about that? I mean, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, and it's a big question. I think old, you know, most people who are the people at rallies, and the, the Trump the, the, the hardcore base Trump supporters are people who felt a lot of vertigo and a lot of disruption in their lives, um, you know, changing notions of work and masculinity and, and religion and gender identity and, and, and uh, all of those, you know, sort of, and, and, you know, racism and all of those big issues. And I think somehow you know, they, they have, and all that's taking place also, don't forget, you know, in this in, 
incredibly increasing inequality in this country. And, you know, I think that the deep programming has to be, you know, actually sort of talking to those people and addressing the, the inequality and the, the, you know, some of these, these things that, I mean, there, there's a certain degree of turbulence that's going to happen because people are, you know, culture changes. Um, but at the same time, you know, economic security and, uh, you know, some of those things need to be addressed for, for, for those people. And until they are in a fundamental way, I mean, that's the great irony of all of this is that, you know, the, 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 they're turning against and working with the people who are not working in, in their benefit, I would say. I mean, I, I think Exasperate, that exasperating their own problems, sort of. I mean, a number of people are bringing up COVID and about, you know, his whole administration basically getting COVID and um, thinking that maybe COVID would be the great equalizer. Maybe people would rally together and understand and have more compassion. And um, there's a question. Do you think that a number of people who had been hardcore Trump supporters have now been turned away as a result of COVID and maybe not the hardest core Trump supporters, but the, the undecideds? Well, I do think. Go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I, I also saw some questions about Stephen Miller's COVID. Is it, we I don't have an update on how he's doing. We know he tested positive a few days ago, and he's been in quarantine. Um, but yeah, as far as like people being turned off by it, I, I I really would expect that some people who have been impacted by COVID would realize that that you know Trump didn't do the right thing when it came to the pandemic and that he's been conning them all along. But I also think that Trump is so skilled at putting out counter narratives and, you know, talking about how he, you know, he closed the door to China. This is China's fault. And I think that if people believe that, then they're not going to hold Trump responsible or accountable for the failures of leadership that have led to the coronavirus spreading across the country in the way that it has. So I, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I think it's obviously we, you, we are going to see people turned off by it. But what, what do you think, Carl? Well, I think that um, COVID is the single biggest, most important thing that is make that that may make Trump lose. I mean, it's it, COVID more than anything else is cut through. You know, all of Trumpism is smoke and mirrors, and is as his whole life has has been, and. COVID is the one thing that, you know, you, that he can't sort of spin. And, um, you know, I think that the place where we really saw that was the rally in Tulsa, which was this big, supposed to be Trump's big mm, comeback. And, that's true. you know, they had a, a 20,000 seat arena in a very conservative place. I mean, there was no question that Trump, there's plenty of, there, there are 20,000 Trump supporters or enough people to fill that, arena. It's not like he was lo losing support, but only 6,200 or 6,900 showed up. And, you know, I, it wasn't because there, he couldn't get supporters. It was because people were afraid of getting the virus. And that was a little bit earlier in, in the, in, in things when people were still unsure, you know, nerd, maybe more, I mean, you know, the, over the summer, the death rate has dropped, but, and, and, you know, I think that it's clear that a lot of people particularly seniors, um, are turned off by Trump and the virus. I mean, you know, and it may be, it's not like the 40 million, you know, I mean, 63 million people voted for Trump, which is a lot of people, but you, and you don't need to, and, and he still lost the popular vote. So you don't really need to peel away too many in order to shift the election. And, you know, it would be my hope anyway that, you know, COVID in particular has peeled enough of those people away. I mean, you know, I think people were appalled at his, at his everything he did. Not everyone, but a lot of people, if you had a little sense and you could watch him, even on Fox, you know, flailing away and pumping his chest out and, you know, the whole sort of proto-fascist flying in in the helicopter back to the White House and the balcony. I mean, it was all so crazy. Um, Dan is asking, and I love this question, is there an, an inherent flaw in the DNA of Trumpism that no one except Trump can be Trump? <laughs> I mean, because it's about a charismatic leader and who, if, if Trump were to go down, 
And I, I think that's where that idea of where, where we started this conversation comes, like alchemy, the idea of alchemy. You know, there's Stephen Miller exists and there's always going to be, you know, Stephen Miller existed, Bannon existed, you know, all of these people, you know, Richard Spencer. I mean, there are all these nuts out there. But they and, don't have on-camera presence. But Trump was this, you know, he was a reality TV star. I mean, that's he had 10 seasons or how many seasons of The Apprentice did he have? And um, so I think he sort of is uniquely charismatic. That doesn't mean that all these people go away or that it ends. But I, you know, it's hard for me. There, there needs to be this person, this vessel. What do you think, Gene? Yeah, I, I agree. And I do think, I mean, uh, of course, it's not going to go away. But I do think that that if he loses in November, that the Republican Party is going to have to have a reckoning with what it has meant to so um, passionately support him and echo him and 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 parallel him even in in moments where it was questionable to do so. And I think that I think I, I don't know. My hope is that any 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 other Republican leader who would come in would be at least somewhat invested in, in reality and facts and truth and in maintaining a level of unity and encouraging people to not be divided along political or racial or cultural lines. Um, so yeah, I, I do think, I do think that there is something special about Trump um, that has allowed this to really get out of control and, and to really um, spread. But I do, but, but, but yeah, I mean, if, if he goes away, I do think that, that there's hope that even though the, the white supremacy and the hatred will still be there, the conspiracy theorists will still be there, um, there will be efforts to to unite people and, and to, to get people to embrace the truth. And in a way, you know, that's what I and, and, and I could be wrong in this, but I, you know, that's the way in which Biden is kind of the, the perfect vessel because he's so kind of moderate. I mean, Trump's trying to, you know, the Republicans are trying to paint him as something very different, but you know, he is, he's been around for a long time. He is moderate. He does, when he says, I just want to heal everybody. I mean, he yeah. means it. Yeah. And, and, you know, he may be, you know, that may be a, a something we need. Well, a number of people are asking that question. Barbara Walkholder is saying, so the genie is out of the bottle. How might, can Biden put it back inside? And Linda, you know, in the same vein is saying, what will it take to unite our country again in the post-Trump era? Is it possible to bring his ardent supporters to a point of acceptance and acceptance of our democratic values? Or are they going to embrace violence? I think, so. I think well, what, what this reminds me of is, um, you know, Stephen Miller's, uh, th there's this woman that I that I write about, Katie McHugh, who she was an editor at Breitbart, who says that she was radicalized by Stephen Miller, just pumping her full of articles, like constantly sending her articles about uh, the violence committed by immigrants and black people and things like that, to the point where she came to believe that they were um, actually uh, harming this country and that we needed to to, to get rid of them. Um, but when she realized that her own movement that she had embraced, this white supremacist movement, was actually behind a lot of violence, like when she saw Charlottesville, then she began to back away from it. So I think, I, and and she ended up sharing her, her emails that she exchanged with Stephen Miller with the Southern Poverty Law Center. And that's how we know that Stephen Miller is so sympathetic to white nationalism and white supremacy because of all the emails that he shared with her. But I think I think that if if enough people realize how dangerous the ideologies that they've embraced are and like the the violence that it is associated with, I think that would turn off a lot of people. I I I, I don't think that the average person who has embraced conspiracy theories or who has embraced white genocide theories, um, I I don't think that they actually want to kill people or to see people killed. Um, and maybe that's naive, but I, 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 I really don't think that most people's yeah, instinct is for mass violence. I agree with that. I mean, just like it's, there's a relatively small portion, you know, the, the, the GOP and Trump talking about the boot, the, the burning and the looting and the violence and, you know, these horrible Antifa people who are going around doing all these terrible things. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're a very small minority. I mean, they're small. It's not that many people. 
And it's the same. I believe that the violent right wingers are the same. I mean, you know, most of the Trump Trumpians that I met and spent time with in the rallies were people who <laughs> loved Trump and they were passionate about him and all of eh, eh, but they weren't people who were going to take up a, an AR-15 and go shoot somebody. I mean, they are, they are more like white supremacist extremists are more dangerous. Like they have, yeah, but, yeah. but, but I don't think like the people that you spoke with are not, they're, they're, they're not inclined to violence. And I think that like, yeah, I think, I think that, I agree that, that that most of these people do not want violence. And if they realize that their movements are associated with violence, they might start to walk away from them. I'm wondering what you think about Biden's messaging and are he and Kamala Harris doing a good job of appealing to potential, uh, you know, former Trump voters from the last time around? Well, they're up 12 points. So <sighs> Um, but have you, like, for example, I don't know if you've stayed in touch with people that you've met at these rallies, and have you met anyone who has told you that they've now changed camps? No. I mean, you know, the people that I spent time with the, are most people who go to, don't forget, there are awful lot of people at a Trump rally, but there are more people who aren't at a Trump rally than are, and are at a Trump rally. You know, I mean, for all the rallies, and he has them so much, but... There's still, if you added up all the people in the world, in the United States who've been to a Trump rally, I mean, it's not that many. I mean, you know, I don't even know if it's a million people. So, you know, the, the people who make their way to a Trump rally are generally in the, not everyone, there are a few sort of curious people, but, you know, tend to be a little bit harder core. And, you know, they, you know, they all think Biden, you know, they all buy the, the you know, that Biden's like a, 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 a you know, a, 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 a retirement home guy who's sort of unplugged and wheeled out and um, is, uh, you know, going to lose and completely ineffective and he's, you know, corrupt and he's dishonest and he, you know, they, they're well, not swayed. I shared that meme of Biden today sitting like in a wheelchair in a nursing home. Right, you know. so that is his messaging that he's trying to get through. Um, I know that there was recently like a very big piece about how Jared Kushner is the most uh, powerful person in Washington. What is the power struggle like between Kushner and Miller? Well, so there is, I mean, that's very important because Stephen Miller, one of the ways he's been able to stay so long in the White House is that he's been very careful to stay on the good side of Trump's family. He knows that Trump's family is very important to Trump. And, you know, if you if you want to demonstrate loyalty to the president, you have to have a positive relationship with his family members. And so he disagrees with Jared Kushner on many things. When it comes to immigration, for example, Jared Kushner is far more um, liberal and more, more willing to, to bring in pe people on worker visas if they are seen as as bringing in high skills for companies and things like that. I mean, if it were up to Stephen Miller, we would have eliminated all worker visas already and we would have slashed <laughs> refugee admissions to zero. We've got it at historic lows and we're seeing these visas restricted significantly and completely dismantled the asylum system. But, but he's been held in check to a degree by, by the fact that he needs to maintain a positive relationship with, with Jared Kushner. And, you know, I would disagree that Jared Kushner is the most powerful person in the White House simply because Trump, for, for Trump, the most important thing is getting reelected. And, and, and he thinks that to get reelected, he needs to follow Stephen Miller's advice. And Stephen Miller always pushes him in the most aggressive direction when it comes to his rhetoric, saying the most incendiary things possible. He pushes him in the most aggressive direction on his policies. And he's found that that is what gets his base, his hardcore base, really excited. And Trump thinks that he needs that base to, to win. So I, I would just argue with with who's the most powerful, but the, but they, I mean, they they obviously have to work together and have worked together and compromised on on the immigration issue. Um. So just uh, to wrap things up because it's getting um, real close to eight thirty. This um, I just want to read this um, from Evelyn. She says, "Thanks for a most honest and enlightening discussion." 
Um, any, uh, do you want to prognosticate at all about what's going to happen in 19 days and now five hours? <laughs> I don't. I was taken completely by surprise in 2016. I was one of the people who did not expect Trump to win. So I, I hesitate to to foretell the future in this in this case. I'm just going to wait and see what happens. You know, when you're driving down the highway and you say, it's amazing there's no traffic. And then <laughs> as soon as you say that, the traffic gets really bad. So I, too, feel a little bit hesitant to say... Um, what I hope to happen. Well, we, I guess based on these books, we <laughs> hope to happen. I would assume that most of the people watching um, feel like we can bring back hope. We can bring back compassion. We can bring back the soul uh, of a nation, or I guess as Biden says, I believe it's build back better. Um, so these two books are important reading for everyone's library. They're available in hardcover. They're available in ebook. They're available in audio book. And you can find them on all e-tailers, retailers. Um, and just thank you both for sharing your wisdom, your insight, your reporting, and your time with so many people tonight. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you all. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Jean. And thank you, Lisa, for another great job moderating. Thank you all. And uh, we will be sending out a recording of uh, tonight, tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Bye-bye. Good night.